Yeah. But Welcome to Wall Street versus Main Street, a different take on the investment show with our host Dax White. Dax White is the managing partner of the White Law Group, a national securities fraud, securities arbitration, and investor protection law firm with offices in Chicago, Illinois, and Vero Beach, Florida. The White Law Group has represented hundreds of investors in FINRA arbitration claims against their brokerage firms, and throughout this show, Mr. White will shine a light on some of the tricks of the brokerage industry, while also providing valuable information for investors on how to successfully navigate the investor-financial advisor relationship. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. Uh, as the lead-in indicated, this is a different take on the investment show, uh, unlike some other ones where they are actually giving you investment advice and trying to solicit and solicit business in that way. Uh, I'm, I'm not an investment professional. That's not the objective. That's not what we're going to be doing. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm a securities attorney who represents investors and in claims against brokerage firms. And the objective of this show is to pass along some of the information that I've picked up through the course of my practice that I wish more investors knew so that they wouldn't be in a situation where they would need someone like me. Um, you know, the brokerage industry is, is very much tilted against you and set up in a way to try to extract as much money from you as possible um, while also trying to make it seem like they're looking out for you and, and trying to, you know, help you save for the future, et cetera, et cetera. And, and on a personal level, financial advisor to investor, that, that is often exactly the case. But at the Wall Street level, uh, that, you know, head of brokerage firm level, I mean, their businesses, their, their objective is to try to make as much money as possible. And, and there's, you know, certain ways that they do that. And so the objective of this show is to shine a light on some of those tricks, pass along some of that information that I've seen through, you know, hundreds of cases that we've handled with the hopes that you'll be a little bit better educated, a little bit wiser to some of their tricks so that you can have a more productive relationship with your financial advisor. And so each week we'll talk about different topics uh, with that in mind, trying to pass along some of that information. Um, this week is a slight departure because we're not going to be talking about generalities, you know, things that I've seen, things to look out for. We're actually going to be talking about two specific things that are happening in the market right now, two investments that are imploding that are private placement deals that you either have, have heard of this, very, unfortunately, or are very akin to what's going on, or hopefully you've never heard of them, um, but certainly you will want to avoid them, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, the, the first one is a company in Oregon called Aquitus Commercial Finance. And again, 99.9% .9 of you have never heard of that, heard of them, and I hope that's the case. Um, but for those of you that have, you probably do know what's going on. Uh, Aquitus is a, a, an investment sponsor. Like I said, they're in Oregon, and they put together private placement deals, uh, Reg D private placements, which means that they... Uh, under an exemption of the SEC requirements are, are not. Um, uh, it, it's an exemption from registration, so they're not registered investments. They don't have the same uh, compliance and supervision and, and regulatory um, you know, oversight, which is a red flag just in general for pri private placement deals. But, but this is a specific one that they've filed under those exemptions and have raised hundreds of millions of dollars over the last couple of years, primarily um, investing in student loans. Uh, there's a college out there called Corinthian, and they've essentially financed that debt, and the returns that they're offering to investors are the student loan payments that are being made uh, by the students or by the former students. Um, and they've done this through a number of various investments, uh, including their secured subordinated notes, and then they've got like an opportunity fund. But the, the main crux is, if it says Aquitus on there somewhere, that's, that's an unusual name. That's generally what you're, you're investing in is some private placement deal offered by them, again, that primarily is focused on um, investing in these student loan deals. And, and, and the first red flag, and, and this is what's significant because unfortunately they've been selling these investments up until recently, uh, but the first red flag was that Corinthian College actually came under a lot of problems two or three years ago where they were uh, criminally charged and, and, and it was alleged that they had uh, been fraudulently inducing students to come to their college, uh, take on these huge student loans. And, and we've seen this, unfortunately, through a lot of these online colleges where people take on massive debt, and they're not any better off when they graduate. Their job prospects aren't any better. 
um, and and their ability to repay the student loans is is is, is quite is, is quite challenged. So Corinthian is one where you know they actually got into trouble for for these sort of predatory loans, um, and Aquitas was the main backer of financing that debt, uh, where you had you know wealthy investors buying you know into these funds, which again basically bought the debt, and then the payments back to the investors were the student lo- students making their loan payments. Um, and so the the first red flag would be that, you know, you you've potentially got these predatory loans where the government might step in and, um, you know, I, I guess the worst case scenario for investors in these funds would be that they would say that the the students don't have to pay it back. Um, and, and so that would be the first red flag. If you had a financial advisor over the last few years telling you this is a safe income producing investment, that would be a a, a misstatement because there actually was an there's an enormous amount of risk in these investments because. Uh, you could be in a situation where the government steps in and says, nope, they don't have to pay you anything. Um, so that's the first red flag. More recently, uh, despite them saying that everything was was going great, and we've talked to investors who were buying these investments as recently as December of 2015, but in January, they acquired us, sent out to investors uh, a notice that basically said, we're, we're halting distributions because our cash flow is so poor. Uh, we're talking to debt restructuring uh, you know, consultants, which is uh, bankruptcy consultants, and we're cutting our staff. Um, and so that was what happened recently that would, of course, be a huge red flag. And, and that's what spurred a lot of investors, I think, to reach out to attorneys because they realize, you know, holy cow, this could be really bad. Um, but it's certainly suggestive of a company that has enormous cash flow problems, uh, ability to pay investor problems, and may not be here much longer problems. Um, and then the, the last thing that's happened within the last week or two is that the SEC actually charged them and have called them basically or alleged that they're basically a Ponzi scheme where the more recent investments or the, the more recent money that's been brought in by investors. And again, we, we're talking to an investor who bought as recently as December. So a couple of months ago that those, those cash infusions were essentially used to pay old investors. And that, that is the hallmark of a Ponzi scheme where new money uh, is used to pay old investors, and as long as you're bringing in new money, people aren't the wiser, and that and that can proliferate for years. Look at Madoff; that happened for years and years and years. Um, but once you have, once word gets out that things are bad, people start asking for their money back. That's when those things implode, and it seems to be that's sort of where we're at now. Um, you know, Aquitas, you know, they, they've, they're they're going to be fending off SEC charges. They've all but acknowledged they've got cash flow problems. They may even be forced into bankruptcy here at some point. Um, so if you've got a financial advisor who's still talking about Quitus, don't walk, run, uh, because they've, they've got substantial problems. Um, the, the other thing that was interesting in terms of how they raise their money, and, and this is a huge conflict of interest, which frankly, even though I've been doing this for years and years, I've never seen this, but they were actually financing the financial advisor's practice. They were buying in as an equity partner in the practice if and sort of in exchange for you selling our products. Um, and so they created this enormous conflict of interest by basically giving financial advisors a huge check for, you know, percentage of their advisory business uh, in exchange for getting in there and having that financial advisor then turn around to their clients and recommend Aquitas products to them. So, you know, the, the investors we've seen have primarily, you know, been stuck in that situation where I think the writing's been on the wall for, you know, going back to the Corinthian stuff two, three years ago, but you still had financial advisors pushing it recently. And I, and I think it was, in fairness to them, it, naive, but but potentially just fraudulent, um, where maybe they had figured out, you know, this isn't in my best interest, but, I, you know, I've, I've, I've got bosses now, you know, Quietus bought a substantial part of my firm, so now I've got to sell their products. So... Um, so again, that that's one that's happening right now. It is, you know, I think it's primarily uh, West Coast at this point. So for our Florida listeners, hopefully you've never heard of this. Um, but we're talking to people in California. We're talking to people in Oregon. We're talking to people in Washington. Um, so it's you know, it's not Oregon specific, uh, and and I'm not sure how far the fingers have gone. Um, but but again, you know, until recently, people were still selling this. So if you're a financial advisor, if you're talking about it right now. Uh, you know, like I said, don't walk, run. Uh, and certainly if you've bought it and you've got concerns, you should be talking to lawyers because the other thing that I am concerned about is a lot of the firms that sold this aren't huge firms and, and there might be collectability problems where, 
you know, the first in line is where you're going to want to be because the last person in line, there's going to be no money left. So um, certainly I would suggest that investors in Aquitus, you know, not wait to see how this plays out, not wait to see how much they get in a bankruptcy, uh, because if you wait to do so, you might be left, uh, you know, holding an empty bag. So, so that's the first one that I definitely wanted to bring to the attention of our listeners uh, and our viewers, because uh, that's one where we've got some substantial concerns for investors, and I certainly wouldn't want new people getting into it. And for those people who are stuck in that situation, again, protect yourself, talk to some lawyers, figure out what your options are. Uh, the second one is a company in Texas called United Development Funding, uh, often uh, referred to by the abbreviation UDF. And this is one, again, like Aquitus, that raised money using private placement deals. You know, a big chunk of our practice, unfortunately, uh, deals with private placements, and it, and it does have to do with the regulatory requirements. Again, these are Reg D private placements, which is an exemption under the SEC rules, which basically says as long as we're only selling these to accredited investors, uh, we don't have to register with the SEC and go through the whole process of this being vetted. Um, and so what, of course, ends up happening then is that you get a lot of money raised this way where had they been vetted, had, the, had they been, uh, had gone through the registration process of the SEC, maybe they don't get approved. Um, sometimes it's a perfectly reasonable way to raise money, but, but in many cases you end up with investments that just, they're bad investments. Um, and it looks like UDF might fall into that category. What's interesting about this one is it's actually been around for a number of years. They're generally real estate deals, so they're, you know, they're buying up real estate. Um, you know, they're sold for the income potential that exists there. And they've, they've in theory worked for a number of years, uh, where investors in UDF probably thought, you know, this is going pretty good. My financial advisor told me I'd get 7% interest and I'm getting that. Uh, and it seems like the value is still there. So, you know, I'm happy. Um, unfortunately things more recently have changed dramatically. Um, and now it looks like similar to Aquinas that this may very well have been, you know, new money paying old money situation, which has, again, hallmarks of being a Ponzi scheme. That's not been proven, but it's been alleged. Uh, the first red flag that came out was back in December. Uh, there's a, a very successful hedge fund guy in Texas named Kyle Bass, and, and he came out with a letter that essentially accused UDF of being exactly that. Uh, UDF's response is, this is just Kyle Bass trying to drive down the stock so he can buy it cheaper down the road. I don't know what the, the outcome of that will be, but that, again, was the first suggestion that we've got problems at UDF. More recently, UDF was actually raided by the FBI, uh, following, followed by a subpoena, and, and it's clear that they're investigating those allegations and, and trying to figure out what's really going on there. The stock, uh, UDF, so there, there's multiple offerings. The ones that we primarily are seeing from investors is, is UDF 3 and 4, uh, UDF-4 actually went public. That, that's always the goal of these private placements is you buy it, it's a liquid, we're going to pay in interest, and at some point we're going to try to take this thing public, and then it's traded on the exchange. Um, and UDF-4 actually did go public. Um, that stock was halted recently. It, it was as high as, I think, like seventeen seventy per share. It was halted at $3.20 per share. Um, and Lord knows what would happen with the stock if they actually unfroze it and allowed the market to dictate a price. But it, but it, I, my opinion is that it would go substantially down. So regardless, from 1770 to 320, those are huge losses for UDF4 investors. And my suspicion is that UDF3, which is not public, but certainly on a secondary market, if you were able to find somebody willing to buy it, they're probably going to be doing so uh, at a substantial discount. So... You know, again, that, that's another one where, um, you know, it, it looks like there's some substantial problems. There, there have been class actions filed against UDF. Um, again, you've got the SEC that's investigating them, or excuse me, the, the FBI is investigating them and has actually raided their office, and you've got these allegations of it being a Ponzi scheme. Um, we're, we're currently uh, representing investors in UDF and also investigating claims involving UDF um, but again, you know, as we've talked about in this show, what we do is represent investors in claims against brokerage firms. So we're not looking at claims against UDF specifically for a variety of reasons. Uh, the first of which is, is collectability. I mean, I, I don't know how, what the viability of that firm really is, but also it's, it's a Texas-based company, and I'm a lawyer in Vero Beach, and we have offices in Chicago. So 
you know, we do have a national practice, but we have that national practice because in the investor brokerage firm uh, relationship, those cases are FINRA arbitrations. So as, as an attorney, as long as I'm licensed in one state, I can do a FINRA arbitration in virtually every state. Um, and so, you know, that's the other reason is that, you know, we, we actually would not be able to uh, have capacity to bring claims in Texas directly against UDF. But instead, we're looking at the brokerage firms that sold this. Uh, you know, the, the reality is, given the, the allegations that have come out and some of the things that have come to light more recently, it looks like brokerage firms would have some substantial problems justifying their due diligence. Uh, brokerage firms have two main obligations to you, uh, the first of which is to perform due diligence to make sure it's a viable offering and that it should be sold to everyone. Uh, and that's called their... their um, reasonable basis suitability standard, which basically means, again, we're going to look at it and make sure that this, this would be okay to sell to anyone. Um, and, and given what's going on with UDF, it looks like maybe they'd have some difficulty demonstrating that. You know, certainly there, there appear to be some red flags that have been missed uh, by those firms that were selling it. The second thing we're looking at, the second obligation that brokerage firms have to you, uh, which we actually talked about last week when we were talking about the Department of Labor potentially invoking a fiduciary standard, which doesn't currently exist, at least from the brokerage firm's perspective. But what does exist is a suitability standard to you. So they've got an obligation to take into account your age, your net worth, your income, your investment objectives, and your investment experience to make sure that an offering is suitable for you. Um, and in the UDF context, what you're talking about is an illiquid, super high risk, high commission investment. Um, and so what we see, unfortunately, uh, because of that high commission, is we're seeing it being oversold, uh, so in, in too much, you know, quantity um, to people who can't afford that risk. Um, you know, if you've got 10 million bucks, good for you, uh, but if you've got 10 million bucks and you put 50 grand in UDF uh, and they disclose the risks to you and they tell you it's a liquid and they tell you you could lose all, your, all of your money, then, then that's not something that we're necessarily interested in. We'd still take a look at the due diligence component of a case, but, but the suitability part and, and the types of investors we represent are people who, you know, maybe they had a million dollars and they were looking for retirement income and they're 70 years old and their broker put $250,000 of their money in UDF. That, that's too high of a concentration for any investment uh, for you. Um, but certainly one that's this high risk is a liquid. You can't really sell it. Um, and so if it stops paying the income that you were promised, now you've got substantial problems. So those are the types of things that we're looking at. Um, but the, the important thing and the reason that I mention it is, you know, again, similar to what we talked about with Aquitus, if you've got a financial advisor out there telling you, hey, I've got this great offering, it's called UDF. Again, don't walk, run. Um, and if you are in UDF, I highly recommend that you talk to lawyers and figure out what your options are, because again, it could be a similar situation where at the end of the day, um, you know, it, let's say the stock price is unfrozen, it could plummet. UDF three probably will never make it to market. I mean, why would they take it public now? The market will uh, will hammer it. Um, and so investors in those products are, are, are probably substantially damaged and you know, again, it's going to be a situation you're, you're going to want to be first in line, um, not just in claims against UDF. I mean, if there's class actions out there, which I think there probably, if there aren't now, there, there will be. Um, but, you know, if there's class actions, uh, but even claims against brokerage firms. I mean, a lot of times the firm, and, and this is usually the hardest part for us, um, you know, so, so few of our claims are against the Morgan Stanleys of the world because the reality is they have great compliance. It's usually against smaller brokerage firms that you and I have never heard of and we're evaluating a case, wondering whether or not they've got the, okay, now we've, we've, we're confident that they've screwed up, they've done, they've done wrong, but do they have the money and the ability to pay you? And so a lot of the firms that sold UDF are probably smaller and have limited financial wherewithal. So again, you're gonna wanna get first in line because if you're late to the party, there may not be any money left. So um, that's just the, the caution what, that I would, would tell to investors, both in Aquitus and UDF, those are two things that are happening right now. Um, and, 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 and again, it's, it seems like really bad news for the investors. So if you're not in them, avoid them. And if you are in them, you know, evaluate your options. Um, and, and now we're going to take a break.
Dubose and Sons Jewelers. Inside, you'll find Mike Dubose sitting in the back, head down, wearing that weird little visor. You know the one. It has a magnifying glass on it. You see, Mike is a real jeweler, a master jeweler. Mike Dubose and his sons are experts, but they're also your neighbor. They'll treat you like family. Citizen watches, diamonds, necklaces, anklets, rings, special orders, and of course, custom pieces by master jewelers. Dubose and Sons Jewelers in the Colonial Plaza, Old Dixie Vero Beach between 8th and 12th Street. 1-800-HIGH-MITCH. What's that number and who is Mitch? 1-800-HIGH-MITCH is the number for Mitch Maxfield's Carpet and Furniture Cleaning Services. Serving Florida's Treasure and Space Coast for over 30 years. And Mitch still does the work all himself. Call 1-800-HIGH-MITCH. Mitch Maxfield personally will clean your home or business. Call now for two rooms of carpet cleaning for $77 or a six-foot sofa for $66. Maxfield Carpet Cleaning is a member of the iTex trading community and welcomes your iTex dollars. 1-800-HIGH-MITCH. Minuteman Press of Vero Beach, covering the Treasure Coast from Port St. Lucie to Sebastian, can handle all your printing and copying needs, from large format and blueprints to business cards and brochures, plus a full line of promotional products. Minuteman Press of Vero Beach. Google it. Minuteman Press. Get a free quote. 567-4645. Minuteman Press is a member of the iTex trading community. Your iTex dollars are welcome. You can trust Sandpiper Pest Control, serving Indian River, St. Lucie, and Brevard. Certified by the state of Florida to treat homes, lawns, and termites. Fully licensed and insured. Priced right. Effective and friendly. Hi, this is Joel, the owner of Sandpiper Pest Control. Sandpiper can solve your pest issues. No contracts to sign, just results. Call for a free estimate, 772-589-0204. Sandpiper Pest Control, a member of the iTex trading community. Your iTex dollars are welcome. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. I'm your host, Dax White. Uh, before the break, I was going through two investments that we're seeing right now uh, that are that are imploding and cautioning you on, you know, certainly not investing in them, but if you're already in them, you know, figuring out what your options are. And if you missed it, those investments were Quietus Commercial Finance and United Development Funding or UDF. So uh, certainly, as I said, if you've got a financial advisor who's recommending that to you, you know, do some research on it. It's not something that I think you're going to want to be in if you're in it. Uh, you know, certainly look at what your, your options may be. Um, it, it, with the last few minutes here, uh, the information I wanted to pass along, and, and we've done it in previous episodes, but I, I just feel like if, the, if there's nothing that you take from this show, I, I hope you at least take this. So I, I do talk about it a lot, but that is how to investigate your financial advisor. There actually is a fantastic resource by which to do that that unfortunately most investors just don't know about. Uh, and it's called a Finner Broker Check. You can access it at, at Finner's website, which is F-I-N-R-A dot O-R-G. And if you go there, right there on the homepage, top right-hand corner, it says Finner Broker Check. You type in your broker's name, and it will give you a report that tells you virtually everything you would want to know to make sure you're dealing with the right person, whether you're already with them and you just want to be comfortable and make sure that you've made the right decision or whether or not you're looking for a new financial advisor. Uh, that Finner Broker Report is going to have how they did on their licensing exam, how long they've been in the business, where they've worked, whether they've ever been sued by a customer before, or an investor before, if they've ever been investigated by a regulator, if they've ever been fired, if they've ever declared bankruptcy, if, ever, if they've ever been criminally charged. I mean, again, all, all of the things that you would want to know. Um, so check that out. Uh, Fenner Broker, Broker Check, Fenner.org. Um, you know, that's one where I just, I just wish every investor knew that information because, you know, we see so often where you, where a, an investor calls in and the broker has been sued 40 times and you know that if the investor knew that they never would have worked with that person and they could have avoided being in the situation that they're now in. So, so check out your broker at Fender.org. Uh, if you've got questions for the show, feel free to send them to us. Our website's wallstreetvmainstreet.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else. So. Uh, thanks for listening. 
You've been listening to Wall Street versus Main Street. The views expressed by the participants of the program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the White Law Group, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, nor any of its subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.